Today's scripture reading is Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 25 through 30. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust, there may yet be hope, to give one's cheek to the smiter, and be filled with insults. So is that awkward for anyone? <laughs> well, be prepared. It may just happen again. Now, let me say that the irony is not lost on me. A preacher speaking about the topic of silence. Usually when a preacher is speaking about silence, she or he is warning against silence in the face of injustice or exhorting us to break the silence. And while I wholeheartedly support that sentiment, and you may even hear such ideas come out of my mouth at some point, today we are speaking of silence in a different way. Having said that, perhaps this morning it is more appropriate than ever that I invite us to take a moment of silent reflection on the scripture reading that Carolyn just read for us. Amen. How many of us can really speak to what it is like to experience true silence in our lives? And I'm not talking about when we are sleeping. I'm talking about true, intentional, wide awake silence. It is a rare commodity in our lives today. Outside stimuli are all around us, all the time, touching on each of our senses, especially our sense of hearing. We have, come, we have become used to a constant sense of sound, and we've trained ourselves to ignore those sounds that are most common in our lives. A neighbor's dog that insists on constantly barking. The sound of construction, street noise. In fact, I'm willing to bet those of us who live within earshot of LAX probably don't even notice the sound of planes taking off and landing anymore. Catholic theologian Richard Rohr says it like this, because of iPads and cell phones and billboards and TVs and iPods, we are toxically overstimulated people. For many, if not most of us, what is the first thing we do when we get into the car to go somewhere? Turn on the radio. And often it isn't even to listen to anything specific, it's just for background noise. And we often do the same thing at home or at work with the television or the radio or the iPod on shuffle. And these are just often secondary noise sources for us. For we are also surrounded by talking and yelling and screaming and crying and barking and meowing and the various sounds of cars and trucks and public announcements at the grocery store or the department store or just the sound of children playing or workers working. Life in its many wonderful and noisy forms. As I said, silence is a rare commodity, my friends, and we could definitely benefit from more of it. Let's try for a moment right now. And even when we come to the end of a long day and the phone has stopped ringing and the television is off 
and everyone is asleep, including the pets. When we have that moment of quiet, what happens? I don't know about you, but I pretty quickly drift off to sleep. Because in my life, quiet means sleep. And I am a good sleeper when I can get it. But then the morning comes and the sound parade starts all over again. In our overly busy, overly crazy, overly scheduled lives, just like everything else, if we are going to do it, if we are going to find time for silence, then we actually have to intentionally set time aside to stop. I mean, really stop and be silent. Because this kind of intentional silence, my friends, is not time to be thinking about the list of what you need to pick up at Target. Besides, let's be honest, making a list for Target is an exercise in futility. <laughs> since most of what we pick up at Target isn't necessarily what we plan to pick up when we arrived. And this kind of intentional silence is not time for working out the rest of the day's to-do list or to think about the ideal comeback that you couldn't come up with when you were just exchanging good-natured jabs with a friend or with your child. This kind of intentional silence isn't really even time for catching up on all that reading we want to do, even if the quiet seems to lend itself to that pursuit. This kind of intentional silence is about really pausing for a few moments in the midst of your nonstop life and breathing and clearing your head and creating space to connect with something more eternal than the passing moments of the day. Something more grounding than the myriad tasks that you face. Something more substantial than the concerns of your office. It is about pausing and breathing clearing your mind, and opening yourself up to an experience of God. In the midst of this Lenten season, as we have mentioned previously, we are focusing much of our attention around spiritual practices, ways in which we reach out to God. It may not be directly intended when we speak of such activities as practices, but as we seek to engage them, one thing that becomes quite clear is that we do need to practice. Service and almsgiving, silence and meditation, prayer, fasting, engaging scripture and prophetic celebration, none of these are things that we necessarily include as part of our natural everyday life. Each must be done with intent on our parts. And it would seem that the simplest, silence, may in fact require the greatest effort or the most practice. Yet if we are completely honest, and please understand how big a deal it is for a preacher to say this, it just shouldn't be that difficult, for words are often unnecessary and can frequently get in the way. In many cases, words are a filler to avoid awkwardness or a crutch to lean on when we are feeling uncomfortable and not quite sure what to do with ourselves. There's an ancient proverb, not a biblical proverb, that says, don't speak unless you can improve the silence. How many of us violate that wisdom? <laughs> Have you ever noticed that the use of words often creates a vicious cycle? For when we use one word, we often use more to explain what that one word meant or what it didn't mean. And then we must use even more words to explain what we really meant. And then the uncontrollable world word spiral truly begins. I believe it was Will Rogers who said, never miss a good chance to just shut up. For there is much that can be gained in silence.
And this rule is absolutely relevant in the practice of our faith as we seek to connect with God. Garrison Keillor, the humorous, offered this bit of advice, and I'm paraphrasing. If you're going to speak in church, you better make sure it's good because you are interrupting a direct experience of God. The words we use are often the greatest obstacle in our efforts to truly connect with God, in our attempts to mediate that experience, to frame it or to interpret it, we will inevitably alter it. Again, it was Richard Rohr who said, the ego gets what it wants with words. The soul finds what it needs in silence. For silence is the only thing deep enough, spacious enough, and wide enough to hold all of the contradictions that words cannot contain or reconcile. Now, I'm not going to suggest that we should somehow abandon our practice of speaking and singing in church. Not only would it be a move to put myself out of a job and several other folks here at the church, but it would also remove a key ingredient in the development and living of our faith, interaction with community. Engagement in and with community allows us to examine our own ideas, to compare our own experiences, and to learn from one another in an effort to deepen our individual faith and to contribute to the fullness of our collective faith. Yet we must consider how we might include more space for God in our personal lives and in our worship through silence. And because we must also bring something of ourselves into our experience of community, we must take the time to develop a greater sense of self-awareness, which can and should be explored through intentional times spent in silence, offering God the space to interact and giving our souls what they need. It really is a wonderful experience, the experience of intentional silence. Whether it be just for a few moments at the beginning of the day, whether you do so in what seems a more acceptable and directed way through meditation or mindfulness training, so that it appears like you're at least doing something with your time while you're doing nothing, or whether you simply steal time in between tasks or appointments. In whatever way, choosing whatever means, it is truly worthwhile to engage this spiritual practice, to take that moment of pause in the midst of an otherwise busy day, to set aside distractions, to leave behind the noise and sit in your own space, freeing your mind, if only for just a few moments of the clutter and creating space to allow your thoughts to move and to allow yourself to welcome God in. It was Mahatma Gandhi that said, in the attitude of silence, the soul finds the path in a clearer light. And what is elusive and deceptive resolves itself into crystal clearness. And it was Mother Teresa who offered that in the silence of the heart, God speaks. If you face God in prayer and silence, God will speak to you. And God can fill you. Great thinkers say some wonderful and impressive things about silence, don't they? And your preacher just spent a little over 1,500 words on the topic. <laughs> it's a lot of words to explain something truly profound in its simplicity. Yet what is being offered here is simply a roadmap to something greater to be found when the words cease and the silence comes. Just listen to what the silence is saying. Amen.